My name is Alan, and welcome to the Sound Speeds Podcast, Episode 6. Or if you're in the film industry, that would be 6, because you'd go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, with your hands sideways. It's probably the same way in other industries, too, but I know my industry, so I'm sharing it with you. That's hopefully why you're here, right? It is the third week of October, my favorite month of the year. I love it. The temperature is finally starting to drop, and I'm very, very happy about that. Thanks for joining me, and I don't want to spend any more of your time in this intro, because we have a lot of stuff to cover. It is Saturday, October 19th, 2019. Let's get into it. Amazon Impulse Buys. Raise your hand if you've ever gotten out of bed in the morning and found that the corner of the fitted sheet of your bed has either loosened a little bit or come all the way off. Raise your hand, you know you want to. I had the same issue, and the reason could be because you toss and turn, you thrash in your bed, or maybe because there's multiple people sleeping in your bed and it's pulling awkwardly on the fitted sheet off of the, the corners. And this is one of those frustrating things because you get out of bed and you have to straighten up the fitted sheet and tuck it back in. But I found a solution to that because it drove me absolutely bonkers having to fix the fitted sheet every single day. Now, granted, the fitted sheet was old and I was just trying to milk it because I hate spending money on things that I don't have to, unlike sound equipment, which I will spend money on just because. But when I went to Amazon and ran a couple of searches, I found a great solution. You get four of these for $8. $8 is not that much. It's very much like a suspender, but what you would do, and it doesn't really matter which way because it is pretty much a triangular shaped little device here, but you would, on the bottom side of your fitted sheet, you would clip this onto the corner. And then the other two sides, you would pull across and stretch it maybe about 15 or so inches, maybe a foot or 15 inches out from the corner so that it grabs the corner and just basically going like this, if you would imagine this, it stretches across here and then pulls in the corner as well. So your fitted sheet is basically suspended together. So it grabs and pulls in, allowing it to basically snap back so it doesn't actually pull off of your bed, which is very, very convenient. As a matter of fact, I have been using this and not once have I woken up and found my fitted sheet wrinkly at all ever since I started using it. $8, how can you really go wrong? I put a link down in the description if you'd like to check it out. Something Sound. In Sound Speed Sound Advice, episode number 122, entitled How to Find Quality Earbuds and Loudspeakers Online, amongst other things, we do a search on Amazon and see what comes up when you do a search for earbuds. And one of the ones that I came across had a five-star rating with a lot of five-star ratings. And so that kind of made me wonder if it was any good or not, especially because I said, you know what, I would probably check these things out. Well, obviously, I didn't research it or go into the comments and follow the instructions that I was saying to do. All I did was said, you know what, I would actually check these out. But there were a couple of people that sent me messages and wrote in the comments below saying, how can you endorse something that you don't even know and you haven't even heard? You're right. I'm not technically endorsing it by saying I would check it out, but who knows? I might have actually said something. And so just to at least cover myself, and I'll take this little snip and put it in that segment of the episode uh, by, by you know, putting a little card in there so people can watch this segment. We are going to actually test those earbuds because I did spend $40 on them to try them. Now, I have not opened this up just, just yet. And you guys know I don't like doing unboxings, but I'm still going to unbox this thing and at least look in it and see what's there. Okay, so we have this little capsule thing that is a pill that is too big to swallow. And then it says USB right here. So, okay, I guess this is just a USB plug that you would plug up into the wall or something in order to charge it because they are wireless. Okay, okay, so it has extra little earbud things and it has a USB. Okay, great. So technically we have unboxed this thing, but I don't like unboxings. This is a micro USB to a USB A. Now, here is the goodies right here, and I would hope that it would at least be charged up enough for me to try. So if I press this and hold this, hopefully it would actually connect. I don't know. I've never used these things before. Maybe you have to charge them up before you do. I would really, really hate that because that would mean that I would have to do this segment and record it a different day. So I'm going to try to press and hold on both of these. You're not doing anything? It doesn't really come with instructions, does it? Well, I guess it does. Um, huh. Oh, what do you know? The light came on. Okay, so this light's on. Chances are that means you have to press and hold this one, and this light will come on too. Or maybe that's the controller, or regardless. Okay, so here is my phone. I'm going to see if I can connect up to it via Bluetooth. So you're going to watch me happily go through and find... Oh, geez. 
I pressed the wrong button. I'm connecting up to my Trex Titanium aftershock. So that's not what I want to do. Okay, so it says it's now connected. It only took a couple of moments. And the problem that I ran into is it was connecting to a different device that I have sitting right here at the table. So now I'm going to plug each one of these things up into my ear. Does it really matter which one? I don't know. But the one that was has a light on it, I'm going to go ahead and plug into my left ear. And the other one I'm going to plug into my right ear. Sorry about the awesome hair that you see in front of me. Now, um, I'm going to go ahead and just for the fun of it, play an episode of Sound Speeds into my ear because obviously I have the rights to that. And let's see what happens. Uh, what would be a good episode? Let's test my T-Bone microphones, the two shotguns. So turning this up. Okay, so it's only in one ear because I guess that one's lit up right there. Now if I press this, power on, pairing. Oh, okay. Well, no, they're talking. They're talking into pairing right channel. The, the two ears were talking separately. This one is pairing and it says this one's paired. This one says I found it or whatever. So now it's, I guess it has to pair each one of them separately. I've never done Bluetooth headphones or earbuds before. So let me see if I go into my Bluetooth, how many devices has it connected to? Zero. That's awesome. Okay. Available devices. There's one. I'm going to go ahead and pair it to that one. And it says pairing successful. Okay, so I'm connecting up to both devices now because I guess it has to have a, it has IP010A and IP010AR. I guess AR is right. That is my genius right there. So, okay, so it connected up to the one. Now let's try. Okay, so it does have, I do hear it in both of my ears. Okay, I'm going to go to a different episode because it sounds, I'm hearing the hiss in the background. And I don't know if that is hiss in these ear, earbuds because in all honesty, I don't use Bluetooth at all um, unless it's either the Trex Titaniums or it's the uh, Bose Soundwave Companion. So I'm going to go to a different episode and look at the sound speeds, high background noise versus isolation shield and crash guard. I'm going to try that episode. Okay, there's no bass in this thing. And these, I mean, I don't think my my episodes sound this way. I mean, that is a Rode NT1A, so it would boost it a little bit. Okay, I'm going to go to my, sound, my outro sound. There's no bass in this. Nope. Now, let me pause right here for a second because I'm going to revisit this product two days after shooting the podcast. Last night, I was editing it. Tonight, I was working on the description and the thumbnail, and I suddenly found the desire to test them again to verify my results. And I'm actually going back and reshooting the latter half of this, the Something Sound episode because I disagree with what I said originally. And the reason I think I can do that and get away with it is because I don't think I had the earbuds in all the way. When you stick them in your ears, it doesn't really want to hold on all the way unless you jam them in. Now, granted, I don't mean like jam it all the way in until it's like messing with the tympanum in the back of your ears. No, what I mean is that you just basically put it in your ears until it makes a little seal because the little bits of rubber that are on here, they need to make a seal and block out the outside world and basically make it airtight. Now, when you do that, you suddenly are going to hear a lot more bass. The bass response is pretty good. I wouldn't call this a five star pair of earbuds. I would probably give it about a four and a half, maybe on the bass. It wasn't an abundance of bass, but it was very natural amount. And I did listen to quite a bit of music, but then I listened to some of my own sound speeds episodes. And when I did that, I came to discover that I'm not that pleased with the vo my vocal characteristics and the way I sound. When I listen on these headphones, I sound much better than I do on those earbuds. And it's not just because of the background noise. It's not just because it's Bluetooth earbuds. It's because they don't do an accurate job of portraying the voice. So I went and listened to some more music videos. And when it is very voice driven, it sounds like it's recorded on a cheaper microphone. So 
I don't think that it's worth a five star rating, but I would give it a solid four. The background noise that that I was hearing in it, I did you know listen to some of my other Bluetooth devices, uh, like the Trex Titanium and the um, Bose uh, 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 Bose. What is it? Uh, Soundware Companion. The two products I reviewed, and I did come to realize that hiss is something that naturally happens in Bluetooth, at least with the the listening devices. So I don't think that that was any more in those earbuds than it is in anything else. But I'll tell you this, for $40, I'm actually pretty happy with it if I'm listening to music. If I'm going to listen to, let's say, my Soundspeeds episodes and proof them, I'm not going to be using these. I'm going to be using something more like this or the way I normally do it is I listen to my car. But for, for $40, I think that these are probably a pretty good deal and consider them a good solid four-star rating. Opinionated much? The idea I'm going to be sharing with you is an idea I've had for the past few years. Some people I've shared it with have said that is brilliant. Some people said that's moronic. Why would we ever do that? My wife is actually one of those latter people. Now, I'm going to be sharing this idea because it's something that I think fixes a dilemma that we have worldwide, and that is regarding time. Now, we have time zones, but they don't just split evenly across the entire globe and split into 24 parts no people can decide to redo their time zone like the little island that uh, nation that used to be at the very very end of the day it it decided that they were tired of being at the end of the day and they decided to be in front of everything so they decided to i think sacrifice what was it a day in two hours or something like that and now instead of being at the very very end they're now at the very very beginning and because of that, I think there's a total of 26 time zones of memory serves, and I'll, I'm, I'm sure on the screen right now I'm correcting myself if I'm wrong. But it's very interesting to me how we can have at the edge of those two time zones, literally a street or two over, they're on a different time. And businesses are, it's very confusing if you're right there on the time zone. On in, in another life, when I was a photographer, I was going to photograph someplace that was technically in the central time zone. I'm in Eastern. But because I was going past Columbus into Phoenix City, and because those two are sister uh, cities that are basically one big city, but because one's in Alabama, it has to call itself something, and the other one's in uh, uh, Georgia, it's called something else. Because they are basically all one metropolitan area, they share the Eastern time zone. So when I was calling up and making sure that I, I had all the details correctly, I said, okay, so I will see you at this time central. And they said, oh, we actually open at this time Eastern. And it was an hour before. So if I would have arrived central time, which made sense because their office hours were this time, then I would have arrived late. So that was extremely confusing to me because there was no way for me to know. And so I think it's extremely annoying to have multiple different time zones because if you were to go by UTC zero out of London, sometimes we are here in the Eastern time zone, negative five. Sometimes we are negative four. It depends on daylight saving time. Now, which one are we when we are springing ahead or falling back? Which one is actually normal time? Is it in the summer when the days are longer and that's when we are normal? Or is it in the winter when we're trying to make up time? That's when we are at normal time. I don't even know. Does anyone even know? I mean, write in the comments below if you do know because I'm not going to bother looking it up because I've come up with a solution for it that would fix the problem. And that is if we simply go to a universal time. Now, I am not suggesting that we each have time zones anymore. I am suggesting the entire planet go along one clock. Because if we were to say that, uh, that in England, UTC zero were to become the time that our planet sees a new day, that means that at 7 o'clock p.m., what is now Eastern time, at about dinner time in Georgia, is when we are going to be bringing in the new year on uh, January 1st, 2000, whatever. So it's one of those things where it seems like it's a weird thing to adjust to, but in all honesty, just like anything else, you would adjust to it really quickly. So instead of you going to work and being there at 8 a.m., you would, if you're in the Eastern time zone, as the sun's coming up, you would actually be going in at 3 a.m. because of the adjustment. And 
it, it's one of those things where you're like 3 a.m. Well, it just sounds weird to you now because you're not used to it. But if you were used to it, it would be the most normal thing in the world. This would get rid of all the different time zone garbage. Back in the day, it used to be that farmers were getting, they needed to feel like they got up at a certain time in order to get more days out of the crops and that it's better for whatever. There's actually a government organization here in the United States that is paid money to study the effects of daylight saving time. That is a complete waste of money. I wish we didn't have to do that because it is pointless. If you want to get up early, get up early. You don't need to have an official time change to adjust it. Now, granted, sometimes our days are longer. Sometimes our days are shorter in comparison to nights because, you know, we're at, what, 23 hours, 50 some odd minutes, 50 some odd seconds, and that's fine. But when we break it down, we still have a certain amount of day, uh, daylight and a certain amount of nighttime. And it does get give you in the northern hemisphere, it does give you more daylight during the day hours, and it does give you more nighttime in the winter. Uh, in the winter. So summers are longer day-wise, and the winters are longer in the uh, at uh, nighttime. Or you know what I mean. Nighttime is longer in the winter, and daylight is longer in the summer. So universal time would actually fix that because you wouldn't have to worry about time zones anymore. If you wanted to set your office hours to be at 3.30 a.m. and then say, we're going to start shifting and our office hours are going to change to 3 a.m. That would be because you're doing an adjustment for daylight saving time or what we would now call daylight saving time. But in all honesty, it doesn't need to happen anymore. It's an outdated thing. You don't need to have it. It's the modern era. People get up at whatever time of the day or night. It's not just New York, the city that never sleeps anymore. The entire nation is that way. So we don't need to have time zones anymore. Let's get rid of it. Go to a universal time so there's no more confusion. And even though you don't wake up and go into work at 8 a.m., it becomes 3 a.m. or whatever the case may be it's going to be a lot better. Trust me on that. So if you're with me on this universal time thing, let me know down in the comments. If you think I'm crazy, like my wife does, then tell me that too. Wrong answers only. Jason P asks, is it possible to connect up my XLR microphone to my USB port on my computer? Hmm. That's a great question to ask this particular segment. Jason, I have your answer. And believe it or not, I have to set it up a little bit. And this could get very technical for you, but I want you to stay with me. I'm going to try to explain it very, very simply. On your computer, you have a USB port. And you plug into that a USB plug. Now, in this case, this is a USB-A, and that would go into your computer USB-A. But because this is a male, it would plug into the female. This is the plug, and it goes into the port. So if you were to look over here on the bottom of the plastic, there are four, the plastic being on the inside here, there are four little bitty pins. And they are, you know, numbered one, two, three, and four, <laughs> if you were to have the plastic on the top and the pins would be on the bottom. So it's one, two, three, four, going across from left to right, the way that we read. And obviously, if you were to look at the female end, at which is, this is not, but the plastic that would go into that mate with it would be one, two, three, four, having to match going across that way. So if you flip it upside down, then obviously it would go from right to left, not left to right. But hopefully that makes sense because of the graphics on the screen. Now, here is the interesting thing about this. If you remember the old home phone lines, the landlines you used to have, there were two pairs of phone uh, because it was four wires, right? And your phone cord that went light into your phone had four little wires on it. The inside pair were Christmas colors, red and green. And the outside pair for line two, because the inside pair was line one, the outside pair I remember it because I'm in Georgia as Georgia Tech colors. So don't eat me up if you were like, oh no, the Georgia Tech, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm not saying I support Georgia Tech. I don't follow football. So anyway, the outside pair though is Georgia Tech colors, which is black and yellow. So the inside pair is for line one. The outside pair is line two. Now in a very similar method and manner, the USB does something very, very similar. In pins one, two, three, four, you have the inside pair is for your data and the outside pair is for your current pin number one is your power five volts direct current the positive and pin four on this side would be your ground and on the inside pin two would be data negative and pin three would be data positive so going across pins one to pins four would be five volts current you'd have data negative data positive and your ground and the colors 
that those would be, if you were to split this cable open and look at it, would be uh, red, white, green, and black. So it's not the red, white, and blue, it's the red, white, and green, and then you have black after that. Now black, remember, is the ground. So if you can remember those colors when you were to split it, uh, split the cable, you could splice it in, provided you know what to do with your XLR. Now let me explain one little concept here, because obviously microphones are 48 volt phantom power. Now how are you gonna generate that if you only have five volts of current coming out of your USB? Believe it or not, if you were to take USB, uh, not USB batteries, if you were to take batteries like this 9 volt right here, you know this is your positive terminal, this is your negative terminal. And if you were to take batteries and plug them into each other like this, then you are actually creating an 18 volt battery because this positive comes out, this negative goes out, and it basically doubles the voltage. Now, if you were to do this number here, and you had your positive here going out, your positive here going out, and those went into one terminal, that would be nine volts at twice the, the life of the battery. So this these two positives connect up, those two negatives connect up, then you're actually looking at a double length, uh, double, it will last twice as long battery, but it's still nine volts. But if you were to go like this, connect that up to your positive, connect that up to your negative, this is now 18 volts. Now, if you were to do the exact same thing, all the way up to nine times five is 45. If you were to do this to create 45 volts out of five batteries, and then you spliced it in, you would actually be giving it 50 volts. Now that's not enough to fry your microphone, but it is enough to power your microphone. Now, here you go regarding your XLR. Now, what do you do here? If you were to look at the female, because the female goes into your microphone, right? You have on this side, pin one, pin two, pin three. Pin three is your ground. I'm sorry, pin one is your ground. What am I saying here? And pins two and pins three are different lines. But both pins two and pins three need to get 48 volts of phantom power. So if you were to take your USB one pin, which is your five volts direct, uh, current, if you were to run that into the positive of one battery and then connect up all your different batteries one, one after another like this, so that that way you have a chain of it comes out of the one the one port on your usb and then you go looping through five batteries here you would have 50 volts the negative here goes into the pins two you have to split it goes into pins two and pins three on your xlr and as for pin one that would be the other side of the USB, which is coming in from pin four. So it actually loops through, and then it's basically you got to splice the rest of your XLR the same way it would be. So uh, for your data, uh, for your for the regular microphone. So basically, all you're doing is you're tying in an extra line for the power to supply the power to that particular line. But doing so, if you can follow all of that craziness, that is the way to give 48 volts of phantom power to your XLR microphone. As for plugging it in and automatically being accepted by your computer, it is absolutely done. It, you don't need to worry about the fact that your microphone is analog and the computer is digital. It automatically is converted because the battery takes care of that when you do the up voltage from 5 volts all the way up to 50 volts. It's really cool and you should definitely try it out, Jason. Story time. In 1996, the company I was working for, which offered videography and disc jockey services, trained me to be a mobile DJ. But at the time, I was more valuable as a shooter because you would go out and you'd shoot a video and you'd also do the sound for it. And I was much more valuable to the owner of the company being a videographer than I was a long haired DJ, even though I was definitely up with the modern music at the time because I produced a music video television show. But he did not want to send out a long haired disc jockey for every single event that we did. Sometimes he would send me out for an event. Uh, it was a specialty type thing. And sometimes he would say, no, I think it's going to be best if we covered it someplace else. And you're more valuable to me as a videographer anyway. Whatever. That's fine. So here's what my story is. I also started to get my own DJ gear together. So I had my own system. Because obviously I learned how to DJ with him and I wanted to be able to DJ my own things in case somebody were to say, hey, can you DJ my party? Or, hey, I have a job. Would you like to DJ that? Or I decided to do a party like I DJed my own 21st birthday party simply by prepping CDs and then playing one into the other and just had it cranked up, you know, full blast. It was amazing. 
So, um, and very, very loud, I might add, because my sound system was extremely loud. That sound system, by the way, I recently sold to the television show P Valley. So if you watch P Valley on stars, you're going to see the sound system, or at least part of the sound system that I use. They didn't want to buy my subs and the whole sound system at least. So anyway, I was getting my own sound system together. And at the time I had a production van. And I think this is probably in like two, no, it was probably about 1998. Maybe 1999. I think it was 1998. I was, I got a, a, a job doing an overnight lock-in at a high school. Now, this high school was paying me quite well to go there, set up my subwoofer, set up my regular speakers. They didn't want the light show. So I was basically setting up there and I was going to be playing music while the kids just basically had fun. They played, you know, you know, sports and stuff there. And it was a lock-in. So it was up all night and just having fun and playing games and whatever else in the era before cell phones. And obviously, if you wanted to go to sleep, there were places that were being chaperoned where people could go in there. And with the lights not all the way out, it was somewhat dim. You could go to sleep if you really wanted to. But I was hired to basically play music all night. And my girlfriend at the time, who I dated for about five years, she went along with me. And that's why this is kind of a funny story because I don't like shaving. Now, I know we have the option to get lasered and whatever else, but at the time, you know, I've never really, even to this day, it, my, my whiskers don't grow very fast. So I would basically shave like once a week and it would barely grow back to a little bit of something, uh, you know, stubble or something like that over the first couple of days. It would never really look like five o'clock shadow unless I let it go for like two weeks. Just a wonderful, great thing about, you know, this. I, it also makes it very difficult if I want to grow a beard, but I don't like the way beards feel. So whatever, I'm getting sidetracked yet again, stop distracting me. So here I am wanting to shave, but at the same time saying to myself, you know what? I think it would be great. There's a lot of solutions out there for getting rid of facial hair without using an electric razor or without using a straight razor because I was like, you know, if I do that, I'm probably going to cut my face up because I'm not great with it. An electric razor is easy, and but I always find that I push really hard on it because I want to try to get it as close to shave as possible. And so I said, what are my options? Well, I've heard of this stuff called Nair, and I know they have Nair face. I decided to give it a shot. Of course, on the night of a DJ gig where I was starting at like 9 p.m. and going until 6 a.m., what better time to do something like this, right? Me and my girlfriend were going to be going out there and blasting music all night. It was going to be awesome. So I am up in the afternoon. I go and get her, and I have already bought some Nair. Now, it does recommend that you put a little bit someplace to test it in case it doesn't work correctly or, you know, you want to see how it does with your hair. Then you put it on a little bitty spot, and that way you're not going to completely break out. And I did. I tried a little bitty spot and I did it for the time, which was like three minutes. I think it's like three to five minutes. I put it on for three minutes, took a washcloth and did this number and it came off silky smooth. And my girlfriend said, uh, actually, you know what? Give it a moment here and see if it, if your face is like, you know, how your face reacts. So I said, okay. And so I wiped it off and I was like, you know what? After a few minutes, I was like, my face is just silky smooth. Feel that. That's so awesome. And I had intentionally not shaved for a few weeks because I wanted to make sure that this was done right. So I went full all in. I took the nair. I spread it all over my face and just let it sit. And then I looked at it and I said, okay, you know, after three minutes, I said, you know, that's all it took. So I took the washcloth. I did this and there was still hair there. So I said, huh, I might need to let it sit longer then. So I took the nair, put some more nair back on my face cover up that little spot, let it sit for another minute or so. And then I went and wiped the same spot again. I'm like, well, geez, the hair's still not coming off. So I covered it over with more nair. And this is not nair face, I might add. This is full-fledged nair. And after letting it sit there, I was like, well, geez, this is still not really coming off when I went to wipe it a third time. But I was told at that point, you know what, how long has it been on your face? I said, probably at this point, about six minutes, they're like, take it off because doesn't it say it's supposed to be only like three to five? I'm like, yeah. And they're like, you have very sensitive face, you know, skin. You're going to like fry your face. I'm like, it's not really working. They're like, remove it, remove it, get it off. So I was like, okay, okay. Took the washcloth, wiped it off. And of course it was very, very splotchy, but it did take off some hair and some of it was left on. Now, it also, as I was wiping with the washcloth, 
I was realizing that it was getting a little bit painful in spots. And as I continued to wipe, I started to, you know, as soon as I got it all off of there, I rinsed off the washcloth with some, with some very, very hot water and I wiped it all down. And there was a lot of hair splotches still there. There was a lot of hair that was missing. But one of the things that started to happen is my skin started getting really, really red and it started to feel very warm to the touch. And at this point, I'm like, what happened here? So I, I make the water very cold, put it on my face and say, maybe that's what it needs is cold water. And then I realized that it, I can't put the nair back on the areas of my face that still had hair. And I was starting to break out, you know, where the, the hair was no longer. And so she was like, well, you might as well go ahead and shave at this point. So I was like, you know what, if I put the, the straight razor on there with shaving cream, it's going to hurt like crazy. So I got to use the electric razor. So I use the electric razor on the other area of my face that had the hair still on it. And I'll tell you this, it was pretty painful rubbing that electric razor all over my face because parts of, with hair came off fairly nicely, but the parts that did not have hair on it, that was pretty painful. When I was all done with it, I put some, uh, uh, not not aftershave, I put some lotion on my face because my face was getting very, very splotchy and starting to blister. You know that kind of blister, like if you rub your skin and it starts to kind of get like wet, the skin, the top layer of skin comes off and it starts to get wet and kind of feel gooey. Not really gooey, but kind of, you know what I mean? It's just like the top layer of skin's gone, so it's like reacting. That was the way my face was in areas. It was also very red in areas. In other areas, it was just fine. But regardless, it felt terrible because I was still feeling like I needed to shave in some areas despite using the electric razor because it never really gets down really, really low. But then other areas, the nair worked like a charm and it pulled off all the hair. So as we started to get later and later in the day, we have to get ready to leave. And I am now starting to break out with all these splotches and, and weird uh, you know, blemishes and stuff like that, that looks like my face has acne and all kinds of issues with it. My girlfriend was like, you're an idiot. My mom and other people around were like, that probably wasn't the wisest thing for you to do because you're going to be there all night. And I was like, yeah, I realize that now, you know, genius me. So anyway, I drove out there and when I get there, I look in the rear view mirror and my face looks like in places it's starting to rot. It's very, very red. The lotion is not really doing the trick. It's splotchy. It's red in areas. It looks like it's just blemishing and welting up and offloading the gear. Here I am, like it's supposed to be a, a cool DJ playing all this music for the kids all night long. And I get out and the kids are instantly looking down at my face like, what did you do, dude? They didn't say anything. No one asked anything. They'd make requests all night to my girlfriend but they did not talk to me a whole lot. And that was usually the way I liked it to be. I like to just go out there and DJ and play the music and have people write down things and she'd show up and listen to the music and she would, you know, uh, manage the list for me. So that way I didn't have to interact with people. I could just concentrate on beat mixing into one thing after another, after another. And it was pretty awesome. But DJ Nair was in the house that night and it was not a very good thing at all. Floating. This may sound like a second story time to you, and that's fine if you want to call it that. But regardless, the outcome is pretty cool unless you were the other people involved, so I thought I'd tell you anyway. This story took place in 2018 last year at about 2.30 in the morning. I'm recording some sound effects and playing around with two Rode NT1 microphones. I am being very quiet. There's air conditioning cycling in my, in my house, and I didn't feel the need to kill it. I wanted to just wait until it cycled down, and then I would record because there was some prep involved too, and I had it down to a science where I could prep for a couple minutes minutes, test some stuff. And then when it went quiet, do my recording and not throw off the entire temperature of the house at the same time. So as I, as it gets quiet, I'm getting ready to start making some sounds to record. My sound devices mix pre six is recording and the gain is set up pretty high on it because I'm recording very quiet sounds. And all of a sudden I hear squealing tires and a car flying down the neighborhood. And it's just zipping around everything. I can hear it going through multiple corners because the tires are screeching. And then all of a sudden, as the car gets very off the, in the distance, I hear a crash. Well, I am like, wow, that was pretty interesting. And I, you know, step outside and look around. I don't see anybody or anything like that, obviously, because it was only, you know, maybe a quarter of a mile down the road. And I was looking to see if there was anybody you know, running back from that direction or anything like that. And there wasn't. But 
I did go on the online forum for my community and there were people saying, Hey, did anyone hear that screeching tires and that kind of thing? And it sounded like a crash. Well, no one really responded until the following morning with any good details, but somebody did say, yes, someone hit my house last night. They lost control of their car and they crashed into my garage. Okay. So, uh, you know, it seemed like it was case closed or like it was just some kids that were, that were playing around and they lost control of the car and they crashed. Cause I was like, okay, well the next day I went on a bike ride and that, that same day I should say, I went on a bike ride. And I went and took a picture of the house. Here's the picture right here. Now, the reason this is important is because people were talking about it saying, oh, it was just some kids being dumb or whatever else. And uh, they were obviously panicking because they got out and they, uh, you know, started to run from the police, but then they stopped and then they, you know, the police arrived and they talked to them and they said, you know, sorry, we were just going a little fast and we lost control. Okay. They weren't drunk or anything. They were just being crazy kids. And I didn't feel right about it. The community was like, okay, well, it was just some kids, you know, that were kind of crazy. And I went back and listened to the recording. And I'm going to share with you the recording right here. Now I'm going to play the recording one more time, but this time I'm going to have the picture on the screen for you to look at as a visual aid for the crash. Now tell me when you heard that crash noise, did you or did you not hear squealing tires all the way up to the point of that crash? That's what I heard. I was listening to it and I said, wait a second now. There are squealing tires right in, until the moment of the crash. Now, granted, they did, you know, off-road a little bit, go into the grass, and then the car actually launched into the air a little bit when it hit the house. And when it left the ground, it was on grass. There would not be squealing tires there. So as I started to think about it, I said to myself, I'm hearing squealing tires. I'm going to listen deeper. I listened again. And if you listen closer, you're going to hear two sets of squealing tires. And not only that, once that crash happens, the other car, you know, it's pretty much a straightaway after that curve for a little while. So obviously at that point, the other car, that was street racing with that one started to slow down like crazy. And that car got away. Now I can go ahead and say this completely as factual because I went in the forums and I said, Hey, now I have a sneaking suspicion that there was more than one car involved and people. Uh, and I said, does anyone happen to have a ring or something that was facing towards the road that would be able to see what went by at that particular time? One person posted this video, and when they did, it confirms there were two cars that went by in quick succession. Based on this information, I contacted our local community police officer, who is actually part of our city, but he is also living in the neighborhood, and he watches over our neighborhood especially, uh, especially during office uh, uh, after hours, and he makes sure that we're safe. But he is our liaison. I sent him my audio file boosted and I sent him a couple of pictures I took. He confirmed that there was definitely something deeper there that he needed to investigate. Now we have had in my neighborhood, a lot of issues with people racing cars and just driving recklessly at night. So it's one of those things where, because we have a lot of kids in the neighborhood and sometimes kids do go outside and sit on the edge of the street and look at stars and talk to each other, you know, if they're, if they're dating somebody or whatever, I do not want to have anyone racing down the street and potentially hit one of our neighborhood kids. Not only is speeding illegal, but it's also very, very damaging if they were to hit something like a house that they crash into. So based on my listening and recording, we were able to uncover the fact that there was street racing going on in my neighborhood. So I thought that was a pretty cool find, and I thought I would share it with you in this episode. So there you have it. Yet another episode of the Sound Speeds podcast in the can. And if you would like to submit a question for one of the segments or 
would you like to participate in the voiceover outro? Send that in email form to Soundspeeds Podcast at yahoo.com. In the meantime, go out and enjoy your October weekend. Thanks for joining me in this episode. Take care. If you'd like to ask a question for the wrong answers only segment or submit a suggestion for the floating segment, then send an email to Soundspeeds Podcast at yahoo.com. If you'd like to showcase your voiceover talents by saying this outro, make sure it sounds good, doesn't exceed 20 seconds, and send it to the same email. Hit subscribe for more content both here and on SoundSpeeds. 